Yes, yeah. Take our loan. Yeah, feel free to start if you are ready. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'll start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. So uh, thanks, Jie, for inviting me and uh, the nice kind of introduction. And also thank everyone for coming. I know it's a huge effort for getting up at 9 a.m. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really a great pleasure to be able to speak here to share what me and uh, uh, Rahul uh, Ashvin. Spider, can you see the cursor? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's great pleasure to be able to uh, speak here and share what me, uh, Rahul, and Ashvin have been thinking about uh, recently. And my talk will be based on these two papers on archive. Okay. And uh, and just uh, please interrupt me anytime if you have any um, questions. So as you can see, uh, the title itself is about a rather specific question, how to extract a quantum Hall conductance um, from a single bulk wave function. Okay. Um, but so to better motivate our work, uh, let me uh, start uh, with a bit broader view. So our general goal is to understand the relationship between topological phenomena at a zero temperature and quantum entanglement. Okay. And being at a zero temperature means that I only need to worry about entanglement of the ground state wave function, which very importantly is a pure state. And we would like to propose a general idea, or you can say it's general framework, um, which we call it entanglement response, and uh, which is about understanding an intrinsic unitary dynamics that is generated by the wave function, the state itself. So let's say psi is a generic state and rho A is a reduced density matrix of the subsystem A. And we want to evolve the state by raising the reduced density matrix rho A to the power I S. Okay, so this I is a square root of minus one and this S is a real number. So this guy is a unitary operator. So if you have a, a and, and this thing uh, is known as the modular flow in the study of uh, quantum field theory. Okay, and uh, the title, what the title is about is uh, just one specific application, basically how to apply it and extract the quantum Hall conductance. And uh, we'll show you how to do that uh, throughout this talk and uh, maybe more a little bit more generally um, understand the following triangle, like between top two dimensional topological response, one dimensional edge anomaly and the entanglement linear response. Okay. I guess this direction uh, was already well known and uh, people, I think people also have a vague sense about the other two. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, here we will provide a quantitative answer. Okay, and uh, here's my outline. I will begin with a review on some previous works along this direction, uh, in particular, I want to review uh, this uh, topological entanglement entropy, uh, which is about how to detect topolog two-dimensional topological orders from entanglement. And uh, I will rephrase um, the previous result, this previous study, using the so-called entanglement or modular Hamiltonian, uh, which will naturally motivate our generalization. And then I will explain what I mean by entanglement response, and um, giving some general recipes and how to do that. And after that, I will just propose uh, introduce our proposal for the quantum Hall conductance and uh, providing various, um, uh, what's the setup and uh, providing you uh, various justifications. And I should also mention that uh, there was a related work um, by this gentleman last year uh, about uh, how to, uh, they propose a formula oh, uh, for the Hall, um, or the Cairo central charge. And uh, their result largely motivates uh, our thought. So I will mention them uh, as well when I introduce our result. And we will see that uh, how both results can be understood uh, through the fr this framework of uh, entanglement response. And we also see that how these two results can be combined together to say something interesting. And uh, I'll close with some summary and outlooks. Uh, any question? 
and now okay so yeah let me begin with the review uh, I guess for this audience, I won't have to explain why gapped faces, uh, gapped systems, uh, are, are very interesting. Um, but let me just give a very brief review. Uh, so gapped systems can exhibit a variety of topological phenomena at the zero temperature, or rather in their ground states. And below here are just two well-known examples. Uh, one is called the invertible phase. Um, or you, you can call it short-range entangled phases. Um, Well-known examples are the integer quantum Hall state and some symmetry-protected topological orders or symmetry-protected trivial states, um, and also Kitaev chain, so on and so forth. And for those states, uh, they, are sim they are similarly trivial in the bulk uh, of the system, and all the non-trivial physics um, can be enc are encoded on the on the edge. Basically, you can find some uh, robust, very robust edge mode and that are protected um, by the bulk. Or by uh, if they're symmetry, are also protected by the symmetry. And the other type is known as the is called a topological order. And there, or we can call it non-invertible phases. Well-known examples are the fractional quantum Hall state and gap to spin liquid and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, in two dimension, um, the characterizing uh, feature uh, of this topological order is the presence of anions uh, in the bulk. And it is widely accepted, I think, um, that this phenomenon really arises from the entanglement of the ground state. But how to quantify this connection uh, is a um, generally open question, I think. And uh, the first answer was found for the two-dimensional topological order um, by these diff three different groups of people. And their proposal is now called the topological entanglement entropy, uh, denoted by gamma. So the setup is the following. Uh, let's say uh, this, this uh, rectangle represents a two-dimensional plane on top of which we have a wave, pure state wave function psi. So this is the ground state wave function. And we want to partition and the, the, the whole plane into two parts, a disk and exterior. We call it A and D. So the Hilbert space uh, factorizes into HA, a tensor product with HD. And psi is, a, is just a pure state vector uh, in this Hilbert space. And now we can trace out the degrees of freedom in region D to construct a reduced density matrix on region A in this standard way. And uh, what and now what uh, the, this topological entanglement entropy is about is we want to look at the von Neumann entropy of the subsystem A, compute the trace of rho, log, rho A log rho A. And uh, typically, uh, it will have this uh, area law. So the leading term is proportional to the length, the parameter of the subsystem A, because it's 2D, so its area is a one-dimensional system. And the reason that it's proportional to the length, uh, area of the subsystem A is because we are looking at a gap state. So the most of the entanglement comes from the short range correlated mode. And uh, the, the non-trivial and the universal part is the subleading piece, and we call it, uh, which is called gamma. And this is the topological entanglement entropy. And uh, what they found is that this gamma uh, is encoding the anion total quantum dimension. So if you find a non-zero gamma, that means you the system or the wave function can support anionic excitation and thus is a non-trivial topological order. Maybe a better definition is to consider some linear superpositions of monoima entropy instead of just this single one, because sometimes you can cook up some um, funny examples that uh, although it's trivial, but has non-zero non gamma. So a better definition is to consider this um, this case. So we further divide this um, this disk A into three parts, A, B, and C. And uh, importantly, uh, every three, also there is a region D um, in the exterior. And the important thing uh, is, their, is, is their topology. So you can notice that every three region meet once and only once at a single point. So A, B, C, and meet once in the middle, but 
nowhere else. Okay, and we want to consider this linear superposition, for example, SA plus SB plus SC minus SAB minus SAC minus SBC plus uh, SABC. And if you plug in this um, formula into the into this expression, you'll find that it's exactly equal to minus uh, minus gamma. Or rather, you should take this as the definition of what gamma means. Okay. And uh, to understand the essence of uh, for gamma being topological and why it's a good quantity, and also more importantly for the purpose of doing generalization, let us take a little detour to introduce the notion of entanglement entropy, or what I should really call is just a half-sided modular Hamiltonian. Oh, sorry, uh, introduce the entanglement Hamiltonian. Or um, if you have a high energy background, uh, this is the so-called half-sided modular Hamiltonian in contrast to the full or in, uh, in contrast to the full modular Hamiltonian. And uh, maybe I should uh, say that uh, uh, yeah, and uh, and it, yeah, I should say that for our per, uh, for our proposal, it's kind of important to consider this half-sided modular Hamiltonian instead of the full modular Hamiltonian. Of course, we can extend the result to the full modular Hamiltonian, but then the answer will be trivial, and I will come back to um, to this later. And so, the definition of uh, entanglement Hamiltonian is this. So our, we already defined what we mean by reduced density matrix rho A, and now we just uh, take a log and uh, put a minus sign here and call this guy um, the, the entanglement Hamiltonian, Ka. Oh, by the way, uh, if I happen to, pr to pronounce Ka by as the modular Hamiltonian later, what I really mean is the half-sided modular Hamiltonian. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. So with this definition, uh, we can just rewrite the reduced density matrix uh, in this way. So rho A is now becoming uh, the e to the minus Ka. So um, in terms of this entanglement Hamiltonian Ka, uh, the reduced density matrix now becomes a thermal state at the temperature one, uh, because the coefficient here is one, okay? And the von Neumann entropy now written in terms of the entanglement Hamiltonian can be just uh, regarded as a thermal entropy. So originally, the von Neumann entropy is trace of rho A log rho A with a minus sign. But now we re replace this minus log rho A um, by K. And so it's written in this form. And uh, this is nothing but uh, the, at least it's formally the same as the thermal energy that we have learned uh, when we study uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, very short question. Uh, so the Ka is a Hermitian and its eigenvalue is also called entanglement spectrum. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 thanks. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. And also row A, because uh, as a reduced density matrix, uh, row A has a spectrum that is between zero and one. So if you take a log, um, uh, actually, yeah, the more important thing is that Ka has a spectrum that is bounded from below. Um, and uh, that, that, that has something to do with rho A is the reduced density matrix. And uh, this is a very important property and uh, part of the reason that it's called a Hamiltonian. And uh, yeah, I want to point out uh, that, that entanglement Hamiltonian is actually uh, rather different from the actual physical Hamiltonian. So first, um, because uh, typically we know that the thermal, as we have learned in STEMAC or thermodynamics, typically a uh, thermal energy is proportional to the volume uh, of the system, the total number of degrees of freedom in the system, okay? But here, uh, this von Neumann entropy, uh, in this case, is only proportional to the area of that, that subsystem. So how that can be true? So that actually implies um, that this entanglement Hamiltonian is rather non-uniform in space. And so if you write this Ka as the summation, so here, and this little kx is some operator that is uh, centered at, at lattice side x, and the beta x is the coefficient. 
and we do a summation over all the um, uh, lattice sites. And you know that uh, this beta X cannot be uniform in space, and rather it's kind of vanishing near the boundary of A, but uh, gradually increases as the, as the lattice site X goes uh, deeper and deeper into the bulk of the subsystem A. Um, if that is uh, because, because of that, actually, all the bulk degrees of freedom uh, in the subsystem A are almost frozen and they will not make a contribution to the thermal energy. Only the edge degrees of freedom uh, will make some contribution. And that's why we observe um, area law instead of volume law, even though we are computing kind of a thermal energy. Okay. Um, and the second, also uh, a more important property for the purpose of today uh, is, 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 is this, well, I call it the conversion property. Sorry, I don't have a better name for it, um, but yeah, let me just explain what it is. And it comes from the fact that we are, consider, we are considering the entanglement property of a pure state. So it says the following, let's, let's just take a generic state psi and uh, the modular Hamiltonian on the region A uh, acting on the state psi, sorry, the, the entanglement Hamiltonian on the region A acting on the state psi is equal to the entanglement Hamiltonian uh, on the region D act on the same state psi. So A and D uh, are the complement of each other, like uh, as you can see uh, from this figure. Okay, so, uh, and this property uh, really relies on we are dealing with a pure state and it follows from the Schmidt decomposition. So how, how is that um, possible? How to derive that? So let us uh, um, take this state psi and uh, write it, write down, just write down the Schmidt decomposition, like an A tensor product uh, of uh, ND. So these are some orthogonal states uh, on the region A and the subregion D. And here the square root of lambda is just the Schmidt coefficient. So now we can, uh, let me uh, just, do a little bit of writing. Uh, yeah. So Ka, um, by our definition, is log of rho A. So in terms of the Schmidt decomposition, it's just this, this thing. So we take a log uh, of the Schmidt coefficient lambda and put the uh, basis state on subsystem A here. And similarly, for Kd, uh, we have this form. Okay, so this is what we mean by Ka and Kd in terms of the Schmidt decomposition or Schmidt um, vectors. And now you can see that uh, no matter I apply Ka or Kd onto this state, I just get the same result because Na and Nd are orthogonal. Okay, so we will obtain this result. So although this property looks uh, rather simple, actually it has a very important consequence that we'll see later. And uh, I want to remark, further remark, that this property is just like what you have uh, when you have a symmetry. If you have a symmetry, you apply and the, your state preserves that symmetry. Uh, you, if you only if you transform the state in a certain region, it's equivalent to do a inverse transformation in the complement. So it's like a symmetry in some sense. And uh, this property has no analog with the physical Hamiltonians because there you have some fuzzy boundary terms that connects A and D. So there's, there's no analog in physical Hamilton. Well, on the other hand, uh, entanglement Hamiltonian also has shares certain similarities with the physical Hamiltonian, or uh, more often, um, the edge part of the physical Hamiltonian. This was first realized uh, through looking at the entanglement, uh, the spectrum uh, of the entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, as uh, Jia has mentioned before. So we're uh, here, uh, uh, what is plotted here uh, is the entanglement is the entanglement spectrum, the spectrum of the entanglement Hamiltonian of the P plus IP superconductor in different phases. So here, this is, uh, this is the tuning parameter, horizontal axis denotes the tuning parameter and where the system is in a trivial phase in this region and this region where we can see that the spectrum has a little gap uh, near zero. And this middle part, um, in the middle part of the system is, the, is in the 
non-trivial or topological uh, chiral phase, where we can see that uh, uh, the system, the spectrum is really gapless at, at the zero energy. And if you look at the eigenstate associated to this uh, uh, eigen energy, and they are uh, edge state that are localized uh, near the edge of the subsystem. Okay. Okay. And uh, and uh, one can also understand the, the similarity between entanglement Hamiltonian and modular Hamiltonian in terms of dynamics. So uh, at this point, we can introduce the notion of modular flow, which is about the unitary uh, evolution uh, generated by the modular Hamiltonian itself. And here, uh, so this Ka is sorry, entanglement Hamiltonian. So Ka is the entanglement Hamiltonian and e to the minus s Ka is the uh, unitary evolution generated by it. And uh, we call this the, the modular flow. And uh, again, you can uh, check it in the P plus IP superconductor. You can see that if you put a particle on the boundary of the subsystem uh, in the chiral phase, it would just move uh, in, in a certain direction. And this is uh, important intuition for some later discussions, okay? So after this detour, let's just come back to the topological entanglement entropy. Uh, with this new tool of entanglement Hamiltonian, uh, we can regard the topological entanglement entropy as the study of thermal energy at the fictitious equilibrium. Um, but of course, the statement itself does not tell us why this quantity is so nice. In particular, we want to understand why it has these following two properties. The first is this topological, meaning that it is invariant under the change of shapes without changing the topology between A, B, C. And the second property is, uh, is universal, meaning that it's invariant under any local deformation of the state. So like uh, we heat the state by some local operator at some generic position that doesn't change the answer. And uh, I don't have the time to show you how to derive this, but I want to point out the key ingredients for showing these two properties. The first one is this conversion property that we have mentioned. And the second one uh, is called clustering property, meaning that given two generic operators supported at position R1 and R2, their correlation function factorizes when they are far apart. And the third one is a bit more non-trivial. Um, it says the following. Let's just consider three different regions, X, Y, and Z, and uh, they are connected, uh, joined in this way. X and is connected with Y, Y is connected with Z, but X and Z are not connected. So it says the following. We consider the entanglement Hamiltonian on X, Y plus the entanglement Hamiltonian on Y, Z, and we want to compare that with the entanglement Hamiltonian on X, Y, Z and on Y. And the claim is that their expectation value are close to each other, and the error is exponentially small in the subsystem size. Okay, and uh, this is called, in some sense, this is like an entanglement Hamiltonian version of the uh, strong subrelativity. Okay. All right, and uh, one more thing to say is that uh, when the system possesses uh, some uh, global symmetries, one can also measure the symmetry defect in addition to the von Neumann entropy. And uh, in some sense, von Neumann entropy is also a defect if we think about it in terms of replica, uh, replica trick. And it's a geometric defect uh, if after you introduce all of all of replicated uh, manifold. And uh, and people have introduced this code, so-called topological disorder parameter uh, recently. And the definition is very simple. So we just take the region A and D as, as before. And now what we are evaluating is, is just the expectation value of the symmetry transformation operator restricted to the region A. And there we can also identify a subleading piece and with which they called it a, a topological disordered operator. And again, it is the study of properties at this fictitious thermal equilibrium e to the minus Ka, okay? And after all of those preparations, I guess the generalization now becomes clear, like what to consider next, um, which is to do linear response. Like more precisely, uh, we want to perturb the system a little bit away from the equilibrium and measure the response. And that's, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about now. 
But any questions um, before I move on? Okay. All right. So um, as I said, uh, the topological entanglement entropy and topological disorder parameter are measured at uh, this fictitious equilibrium. And now what we want to do is to do perturbation. And the first question is, uh, what, is the, what is the source? Uh, how, how should we perturb the system? And uh, we want to use the entanglement Hamiltonian um, or the unitary evolution generated by it, the modular flow, uh, to perturb the system. And uh, this is a really natural source to do perturbation because it is this is the intrinsic dynamics that you can get if you only have a single wave function. If you talk about properties of a single wave function, this, this is really gives you the intrinsic dynamics. And then you have to decide on uh, what response, uh, what quantities to measure, and uh, and of course, uh, and also there are uh, natural candidates. Uh, for example, the von Neumann entropy and or some symmetry defect operators, okay? At the equilibrium, this fictitious equilibrium, and these two things uh, already gives you some non-trivial answer, like uh, this topological entanglement entropy or total quantum dimension or, or this generalized one. And now we want to look at the kind of response of this pro and, and these quantities. And we will call this scheme the entanglement response. So let me give uh, maybe a more mathematical uh, definition of what we mean. So we want to take the state psi and uh, map it, uh, do a unity revolution on the state psi using this operator e to the minus i s k at uh, k x. K x is the entanglement Hamiltonian of region x. And uh, what we want to measure is the expectation value of some operator. We call it O y. Um, X and Y are just certain subregions in the system. It's your choice. And uh, and in general, the definition of this O Y can depend on S because you might want to compute O. For example, if you choose O Y as the uh, reduced density matrix in the subregion, that of course changes uh, with the modular time S. So I put a, a S here, and this is what we want to measure. We start with the state, evolve it for a certain time, and measure some quantity. It's the most natural thing you do, or uh, the thing you do every day when you, when you do, like, um, yeah. So, so why the um, modular Hamiltonian doesn't depend on S? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, sorry. Yeah, I can put S here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So in the most general case, it has, has yeah. In the most general case, okay, yeah. Um, okay. And to start, let's just consider the response at the linear order in the modular time as so as we call it the modular time to distinguish from the physical time. And uh, so we want to compute this quantity, take a derivative uh, over s, and evaluate it at s equals to zero. And we want to ask uh, what is the answer. What is, uh, yeah, and what we want to what the claim we want to make is that the entanglement linear response will actually gives you physical topological response, and the more precisely, we want to show that the linear response of some u u one symmetry defect operator gives you quantum Hall conductance, and if you repeat the exercise for the geometric defect, uh, you will get the Kara central charge. Okay. So now it comes to the proposal, our proposal for the hot conductance. Let me just describe you uh, the setup. So again, we take the entire uh, plane as our, as our system, and we want to divide the entire plane, the infinite plane into four parts, A, B, C, and D. Okay, it's important that uh, you, you divide into four parts. If A, B, and C consists of the entire system, uh, you will only just get a trivial answer. So it's, it's important to have a non-empty D. And uh, each of the subsystem has a linear size that is much larger than the correlation length. So our final formula, we have a correction that is uh, exponentially small in the subsystem size. And, uh, and again, I want to emphasize 
that the topology is very important. Here we have four different regions, A, B, C, and D, and they meet and only meet. As the, every three region uh, meet and only meet, meet once and only once, okay? For example, uh, if you, yeah, I will come back to that later. And, uh, and the setup, what we want to do is the following. So we want to apply a modular flow on the region AB. Okay, so we start with the ground state wave function psi, compute the modular Hamiltonian on AB and do a unity revolution in this way. And what we want to measure is the charge response uh, in region BC, okay? And so this is the quantity we want to look at. This QBC uh, is, the, is the total charge uh, operator associated to the region BC. And we want to measure is the square uh, of that operator. And the connection to the uh, U1 defect, op I'll come, come back later to explain what's the connection to the uh, U1 defect operator. And our proposal is that the linear response uh, of this operator QBC square uh, gives you the quantum Hall conductance. So you just uh, take derivative of this quantity or uh, with respect to S and evaluate it as S equals to zero. So you naturally obtain uh, this commutator between KAB and the QBC squared. Okay, it seems to be a little bit bizarre, but uh, you can immediately do some sanity check uh, at this stage already. For example, KAB is a, a Hermitian operator, so is QBC squared. And so their commutator is anti Hermitian operator. And if you put a factor of i, you get a real number, okay, same as on the right and left hand side. And also, you recall that sigma xy has the unit of e squared over h bar. And, and here, we also put a q squared uh, here. So the dimension matches. Uh, sorry, so where the h bar comes from? Oh yeah, I think that has to do with the, uh, um, you can put H bar here, like maybe in okay. the denominator. denominator. Okay. But H bar is also dimension four, so it's uh, important. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Okay, that's fine, okay. Maybe KAB has a H bar, something like that, to compare with- Yeah, 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 oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe when we define this thing, you can put a H bar here and uh, that comes with the H bar. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, and 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 well, uh, now it's a good place to introduce um, the formula proposed by uh, Isa Kim, Boen Shi et al. and those gent four gentlemen last year. So what they have is uh, instead of computing the commutator between KAB and QBC square. Uh, we consider the commutator between KB and KBC squared. Okay, so what that corresponds to is that we do a uh, still we do modular flow on AB, but now what we are measuring is not the charge response in BC, but the entanglement entropy in BC. Okay, how that entanglement entropy uh, in BC changes under the modular flow of AB, and recall that the entanglement entropy can be regarded as a expectation value of some symmetry defect operator in the replica space. So it's in some sense, the linear response of a geometric defect. Okay, and uh, their proposal is that this quantity um, gives you the chiral center charge or rather the thermal Hall conductance. Okay, and before I explain why this formula is true, uh, you can immediately actually combine them. Uh, to say something interesting, we should call it an entanglement uh, uh, Whitman friends law. So we know that in free fermion systems um, with the, some single charged fermions, this is to rule out some trivial factors, uh, we can actually, so the, the hot conductance and the, the, ther the thermal transport and the electric transport are related and uh, with some universal uh, proportionality constant. And uh, here, what we have is the thermal uh, chiral central charge, which is about thermal transport, and quantum Hall conductance, which is about the electric transport. And we compute them through entanglement quantity. And now we can just combine the result and uh, to, say, to, to say this thing. It's like, uh, 
because this part gives you the Cairo central charge and this part uh, gives you the uh, quantum Hall conductance. And now we just put them in this, in this particular way and we claim that uh, it should be zero. Uh, it's just very similar to what you have in the ordinary Whitman friends law. And, uh, but this is an entanglement version of the Whitman friends law. And uh, yeah, I will show how, show some numerical. Uh, you can we we can do some numerical calculation and to check it. It does satisfy it, uh, in free form system, and but I'll come back to more details later. This is just a teaser of uh, what I'm going to say later. Okay, and uh, so uh, before I explain, give you the justification, I also want to mention some previous efforts. On quantum Hall conductance. Um, for free fermion systems, we have this celebrated uh, TKNN formula and also uh, the so called Fredholm index formula. And this guy works in the momentum space, and this one uh, works even in the real space when you have a disordered systems. And uh, it's, it's the, se the, the second idea is also generalized. Uh, to interacting systems. And I should say it's a rather non-trivial generalization. Um, also, um, there are some uh, related but uh, different study, sorry, is there is a study on the related but different uh, topological invariant, which is called the many-body chain number. Uh, it coincides with the Hall conductance for free fermion system, but uh, they are really different. Uh, I'll, I'll also com comment on that later. Uh, more imp most importantly is that this many body chain number is not additive constant. So if you have a state psi that has many body chain number C1 and another state psi2 has many body chain number C2, and psi1 tensor psi2, uh, the many body chain number for psi1 tensor psi2 uh, is not C1 plus C2. It's not, not additive. And, uh, and uh, at least superficially, our formula is actually quite different from all of them, um, but uh, it, they might be related in some secret way. Uh, for example, in free fermion systems, actually our formula, um, which is uh, th th this one. Oops, uh, I think there are some, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, my, my internet was bad, Just sorry. Yeah, our formula, this one, uh, is quite different um, from um, from the, either this TKN formula or this uh, so-called Fred Home index formula, but they are actually related. And uh, one can show that our formula is re actually related uh, to a so-called, not so-called, um, our formula is related to a generalized uh, chain number formula or generalized Fred Home index formula. It's a work pro in progress with the uh, collaborators Tong Fei uh, and Ying Fei, and will appear in our, our archive soon. So let me give you um, um, all the justifications I have for uh, for this formula. Okay, and uh, yeah. So the first thing I want to say is that uh, this guy, denoted by the capital sigma, satisfy all the same general properties as the quantum uh, Hall conductance, the little sigma x, y. First thing is that it's a real number, okay, that's good. And the second thing is that it's additive. So if you take a, a take two wave functions, psi one, psi two, and consider the tensor product and compute the formula for this two, and you can get it's the sum of sigma of psi one plus uh, of and sigma of psi two. Okay, it's an additive quantity. And this property already rule out the, the possibility, that, possibility that it is, describes the many body chain number. It cannot be many body chain number. And second thing is that it has the same CRT transformation uh, as the Hall conductance. So C stands for charge conjugation and it's even under charge conjugation. R stands for reflection and it's odd under reflection. T is time reversal. So sigma is also odd and the time reversal. So how to show that? Uh, it relies on uh, this property. So let me just uh, maybe illustrate how one can derive that for the reflection property 
uh, which I, I personally think is the uh, a little bit non-trivial than the other two. So we want to show the following. So sigma of ABC is equal to the minus of sigma of BAC. So if you do a reflection with respect to this axis, that's just interchange uh, A and B. So if we switch A, B, you get a minus sign. So this is the property we want to show now. Okay. And the recall that our formula takes this form. And so it's equivalent to show that the sum of the two, the left and right hand side is zero. And what's their sum? Their sum is just QBC squared plus QAC squared. Replace B with A and put a plus sign. It should give you zero. This is the property we want to formula we want to show. Okay, and how do we show that? It's kind of important uh, to notice that uh, uh, actually this entanglement Hamiltonian KAB conserves the total charge in the region AB in 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 this disk ABC. Okay, so uh, that means the commutator between KAB and QB uh, and QABC or QABC square or whatever actually it's, it has to be zero. And that is because uh, the system preserves the U1 charge. And so the, the entanglement Hamiltonian also should preserve the U1 charge in that subregion. So that's why KAB and, uh, and QABC um, should commute. So we put a QABC square here, okay? And uh, after doing some algebra, you can show that uh, this combination can be break down um, breaking down into QB, QC squared minus 2QA times QB. And uh, now we notice that AB and C are supported on orthogonal regions. So this commutator gives you is zero. And, uh, and if you want to compute this commutator, naively it's zero. Um, but recall that we can use the conversion property. We can convert KAB into the complement region, which is CD. And now KCD is on the orthogonal. This KCD has orthogonal overlap with QA times QB. And so it's going zero. And uh, so then we like we established this uh, reflection property, the, how we can prove. So you can see that uh, this conversion formula uh, property is really important, okay? Any question about this derivation? Uh, I think I'm a bit quick here. But go beyond pure state, you don't have the conversion formula. But that's, that's right, that's right. Yeah, so cool. that is right. So we, it's important that we consider pure state. Hmm. I think the same is true for topological entanglement entropy. If you don't have a, a pure state, I think topological entanglement entropy is no longer a good quantity. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, the last thing is, uh, is topological, meaning that if we deform the shape of ABC, uh, the results shouldn't change as long as we don't change the topology uh, of A, B, C, and D. And also it has to be universal, meaning that we hit the state, pure state by some local operator uh, somewhere and the answer shouldn't change. Okay. And uh, the, the showing this two property uh, relies on another two, a key, very key, uh, another two ingredients in addition to this conversion um, property, um, which is that, uh, Again, the first is a clustering property. This is what also need when we want to show um, these two properties for the topological entanglement entropy. And the third one um, is a little bit is a bit modification. It's a modification of what of what we have used there. So let me give you the statement. So we consider a state psi, and again we want to uh, take these three regions x, y, and z arranged in this shape, uh, in this way. And uh, what we want to compute, uh, compare is that uh, we now take the modular entanglement Hamiltonian KXY plus KYZ, apply that on the state, compare that with uh, uh, XYZ plus Y 
acting on the state. And we want to say uh, that the two, this thing is close to uh, this thing. Uh, I have to give a sharper definition what by what I mean uh, on what I mean by close. So what I really mean uh, is that we take some, we take the overlap between this thing and the state, maybe put some operator in the middle, put some operator in the middle, and the state overlap uh, are close up to some exponentially small correction. So, so um, I, I do want to point out uh, that, and the last one is unjustified assumption. And it seems to be good from numerical observation, um, but the, right now we don't have a rigorous way to justify it. And uh, I think it has, it's, it's deeply connected um, to this open question in quantum information that how you can approximate a state that only approximately satisfy uh, the strong subadditivity. That's generally, uh, I think that's uh, still an open, um, open question in quantum information. Yeah. Excuse me, I, I thought strong subjectivity was an inequality, but it, uh, it becomes an equality here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, what I mean is this. So uh, let's say we have, uh, we compute entanglement entropy on, von Neumann entropy on XY, uh, YZ, uh, minus XS, von Neumann entropy on XYZ, plus SZ. This is generally a large, uh, this is a non-negative. But now we want to say that it's smaller than epsilon. And uh, so this state approximately saturates the strong subadditivity. Oh. But uh, it's not exactly saturated. And if a state exactly saturates the strong subadditivity, it's called Mark, Mark, Markov state. But uh, we, what, what, we, what we have here is only approximate Markov state. And how should we uh, estimate the distance between this um, Markov state and the true Markov state? I think that's a, a open question in quantum information. And uh, th th this, this thing is related to that. Yeah. Hi, Rima. Um, yeah. Can I yeah. ask a question? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, um, if the strong subadditivity is saturated, let's say epsilon is zero, then yes, this whole thing is Markov. And uh, would the formula that you propose to use for the uh, modular Hamiltonian work, uh, you know, satisfy? Or these are still separate conditions? Because the entropy is like the expectation value. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, thanks. And so you can, yeah, let's just ask ourselves what happens if this thing is exactly uh, uh, satisfied. And we can ask what kind of state uh, exactly satisfy uh, this condition. Right. Those are the state that, that satisfy the strict area law. So let's say, maybe let me just use this figure. Uh, so for example, SA is exactly alpha times LA. LA is the parameter of the region A uh, minus some subleading correction. No furthermore corrections. Okay. Okay. If a state uh, strictly satisfy uh, this form, and uh, for example, then you can plug in uh, this form uh, into this expression and uh, using this, oh, sorry, sorry. This should be Y. And you can see that all the area uh, part cancel each other and the constant P's also cancel each other. So such state strictly satisfy uh, the strong subjectivity. Okay, but such state um, are actually rather boring if we think about uh, the their Hall conductance, for example, Tory code uh, exactly is satisfy uh, every law or some other like uh, state that is described the ground state of some commuting projector Hamiltonians. So if a state strictly satisfy um, this area law or strictly satisfy this strong subjectivity, um, 
it's true that this property will will hold, um, but uh, it gives you a trivial answer for our purpose. So it's kind of interesting. So uh, I guess one comment I can make probably is that I guess it seems to me that the, I cannot derive from the saturation of sub additivity uh, uh, from this condition uh, uh, to derive the, the 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 relation that you propose for k right because I I can just consider some very boring volume law state like uh, you know, like every single spin completely decoupled and in a thermal state, and the, the strong subjectivity is also uh, saturated, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, uh, the, well, okay, that in that case, maybe the case still follow kind of a similar relation, but I'm just wondering um, from a quantum information theoretic point of view, if I don't assume locality, how to what extent the saturation of entropy imply this relation of modular Hamiltonian? Because it seems like the operator um, equation is much, much stronger in some sense than the. Than the oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. this is, uh, I think this is a work by, um, yeah, this is called a, a recovery map or some, and I think it's a work by, um, um by Hayden in 2004 mm -hmm. uh it's it's a non-trivial work um, oh you mean uh, that I can actually derive this if the saturation yeah yeah if this is true it. you uh -huh. can actually derive like k you can just replace x by k okay so using the whatever they call pets map or something uh, you, you can actually yeah 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 this is true I see okay thank you yeah but it's open question that if this is approximately true um, mm -hmm. whether this is approximately, whether they are approximately equal. I and see. the answer probably is no. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know whether they are approximately equal to each other if we uh, consider the action on the state. Got it, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so the re remaining eight minutes, uh, let me uh, give you just a, I'll quickly show you uh, the other two justifications. Um, one is uh, in terms of uh, so-called bulk edge correspondence. Uh, I can, I guess, I only have time to sketch the idea, and it's in some sense built on uh, the previous uh, the previous justification, because we have seen um, that uh, at least if you take our assumptions, especially the third one. We have shown that the sigma x y is a universal quantity. Like it doesn't change if we do smooth deformation of the state. So that means uh, we can just deform the state to a very nice one without uh, changing its value. So we can work with nice states. In particular, we want to consider a state uh, whose modular Hamiltonian k d is exactly the same uh, as uh, a conformal field theory Hamiltonian, or they are proportional to each other. Okay. And uh, we want to consider the expectation value. So, so we have this relation. So KD is proportional to HCFT with a proportionality constant epsilon. Okay. And we want to consider the expectation value of U1 defect operator log of uh, like e to the i mu cube BC, the expectation value of e to the i mu cube BC. And then we can all, if we can um, understand this thing, or we can always go back to QPC squared by doing Taylor expansion. Okay, and uh, so now we want, and what we want to show is this thing. So we compute the module of how this operator changes with the modular time s, and we take a derivative uh, with s and evaluate at, at, at s equal to zero, and we want to say that this is a sigma x y times mu squared. And if we do a Taylor expansion on the left hand side. And we just recover um, this this result, and in a CFT context, uh, this sigma x y is equal to k l minus k r divided by two pi, and this k l and k r uh, are, are the levels that you can obtain uh, in the JJLPE. Okay, and to see how this result can arise, let me just give you a warm up. I guess I only have time for a warm up. Um, uh, in the just one pure 1D CFT context. And we will see that actually the result can be, this calculation can be used to 
obtain this U1 Carbo anomaly. So what we want to consider is a one-dimensional CFT with a U1 symmetry. So we have a conserved uh, uh, Cairo U1 current J and anti Cairo U1 current J tilde. So JJOP is proportional uh, to KL and J tilde, J tilde OP is proportional to KR. And their difference gives you the Hawk conductance. Okay. And uh, we want to just repeat, uh, and I should also say that the total charge uh, is the total charge Q uh, is just the integral. Uh, of uh, J plus J tilde. And we want to repeat just the entanglement linear response exercise in this context. So what we want to do is that now we consider a circle. Okay, this is the, the system is defined on a circle. And we will do a modular flow on AB. And by just it just follows from conformal invariance and that KAB uh, is given by this form. And, okay. and um, and we want to do modular flow on AB and uh, look at the response of E to the I mu Q B C in the region B C. Okay, uh, look at the response of this quantity. And in the context of conformal field theory, uh, we can represent this guy um, by the insertion of two twist operators, um, V mu and V minus mu at position X and Y. So the two endpoint uh, of the region B C. And uh, the, so for example, this, this guy, this twist operator, that has the following um, conformal dimension and given by H and H tilde, proportional to KL and KR uh, respectively, and they are both proportional to mu square. Okay. And uh, after we do the calculation, and, and in particular consider a very simple limit uh, where ABC formed the entire circle, you can get this result. So uh, log of uh, the derivative, time derivative of this quantity is given by KL minus KR divided by four pi uh, mu squared. Okay. And uh, notice that there's a four, this is a four rather than two. And I'll explain that later. So, uh, but uh, in this limit, we also know that uh, this KAB uh, can be converted uh, to KC. So doing modular flow in AB is equivalent to doing modular flow in, in C. But if we do the modular flow in C, we know that it shouldn't change the charge distribution in region BC. So we should just get zero. Um, so that means KL should be equal to KR for a genuine 1D system. Okay. And now let's ex explain why, why we get a four instead of two. And that is because actually when you repeat this similar calculation in 2D, and there are two places make contribution. One is that the edge of region ABC, the other is that the triple contact point between ABC. So you actually have to pick up two contributions and that's why how you get two instead of four. Okay. So now let me just quickly show you some numerics. And uh, so this is a uh, numerics using uh, for the expert, the pi flux model with some weak disorders where you can tune parameters so that it has two phases, three phases, a time reversal symmetric phase, a non-trivial topological phase with chain number one and a trivial phase. So if you just compute this quantity across the entire phase diagram, you find that it's identically zero in this time reversal symmetric phase, which it should be, and it plateaus to reach value one uh, in the topological phase and goes to zero uh, in the trivial phase. And if you sit inside this topological phase, scale up your subsystem size and look at how this guy deviates to the quantized value you want, you'll find that deviation exponentially decay, decays uh, with the subsystem size. And uh, the decaying power, sorry, this decay, this coefficient is just twice of the correlation length. So it's, yeah. Also, uh, when we provide the justification, our third assumption is not fully justified. Um, it's assumption. So we want to verify that. So here we can deform the shape of ABC and uh, like, for example, in this uh, rather arbitrary way, and you will find that uh, deforming the shape of ABC actually does not change the result across the entire phase diagram, okay? So the three plots, so, so, so this is the curve corresponding to like without deformation, 
after after doing deformation, and you can see that they collapse uh, um, pretty well. And notice that the size of the blob uh, we add here, like we do, we deform this region A by adding a small some blob. Um, the the size of this blob is actually comparable with the subsystem size with the correlation length, but again, the result doesn't change so much. Okay, and uh, and also I want to mention that the change in the topology uh, does have a very significant effect. Um, for example, uh, if we consider an annulus and uh, instead of a disk, so we dig a hole here. The D has like this part, and the, also the middle region on ABC are the red, green, and the blue region. You find that you just get zero. Um, that is because this annulus you can consider it as a has two edges uh, having a, a chiral and anti chiral mode coming from the outer and the inner edge and their contribution in some sense cancel each other because this is why you get a zero result and also if you want to consider a incomplete disk let's say we cut uh, cut a part of the region c and increase uh, this the size of this part you'll find that uh, the answer will gradually become zero and uh, but uh, if you just uh, cut a little bit of space here and uh, fill in with some lattice site of region A, and you will find that as you uh, fill in more and more lattice site, uh, the result will go back uh, to the quantized value. So it's kind of important that uh, if you, so if you cut a, cut a space here, you actually create a, a not a triple contact point, but a, a a quartic uh, contact, uh, quartic or like four party uh, contact point between A, B, C, and D uh, at this point. Um, but if you fill in the lattice side of, of region A, uh, you remove that four party contact point and get back to only triple contact point. So you recover the topology, and that's why you can recover uh, the quantized value. How you recover the quantized value. Also, the numerical verification of the uh, entanglement of Whiteman friends law that we introduced before. So here, this is again the, that phase diagram. And if you just uh, calculate uh, this guy, um, basically the, uh, yeah, and define it as delta, you'll find that uh, within the phase is it's just zero. And uh, it has some little bump as the transition point. But if you further, zoom in to that transition point and uh, scale up your subsystem size, you can see that uh, it's just uh, exponentially decays uh, as you scale up your subsystem size. And at this point, it stops uh, decreasing. I guess that's because of uh, uh, the numerical accuracy, um, because here we are dealing a very actually large total system size. And the subsystem size is 15. So the total system size is actually 15. Sorry, uh, the subsystem size is actually uh, 30, 30. So the total system size is uh, 50, it's rather large. So it probably reaches the numerical accuracy. So uh, now I think I should just stop here with the, with you this uh, um, uh, summary slides and I want to thank you for your attention and take more questions. Uh, thank you, Li Hua, for the um, very clear talk, which is very excellent. Um, so do we have more questions from the audience? Hi, Li Hua. Um, yeah, hi. Can I ask you a question about the previous slide? Previous slide? The, the, the uh, Wittmann Franz law. Yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah. are you suggesting that this relation should hold uh, just Generically, for any uh, any Slater determinant state, for example. Oh, actually, no. Um, yeah, here this critical point uh, it has a Dirac point. It's a Dirac cone. It doesn't right. have a Fermi surface. That's kind yeah. of important. Okay, so because I mean, like you know, if I come back to the the, the conventional context of Bateman Franz law, I, I don't have to care what what. You know what single particle state we're talking about, right? Like heat transport and charge transport are literally the same thing. But you just need some conversion of unit. But here, yeah. uh, 
So what what is the criteria? Like, you know, to what extent I should think of this as a Weidemann France law? I guess that's my question. It, it works yeah, for yeah, Gap State yeah. probably, it works for Duraco, and to what extent I can stretch it? Uh, that's the thing I'm curious about. Yeah, so if you have a do have a Fermi surface, uh, yeah. from a numerical observation, this fails. I see. Um, but uh, we don't have a, we, we, we haven't been able to quantify that. Um, uh -huh. I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. Yeah, I have Is one question. So you mentioned, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Ijran, go ahead. Yeah, is that because you rely on assumptions of gap systems, so it doesn't quite apply to gapless wave functions like fermions with Fermi surface? Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, maybe I should say this. Um, in order to uh, establish these two relation, I think uh, uh, both this formula this previous formula for, for current central charge and this guy um, requires the state to be gapped. But it's unclear that whether that linear combination also requires the system to be gapped. Oh, I see. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's something that I want to understand more. Yeah, but right now I only have a numerical calculation. Maybe there is a comment I can make, which is regard related to this saturation of subadditivity. If mm -hmm. you have a CFT, then okay, assuming that lattice detail doesn't matter so much, then a CFT also give you an area law plus a gamma is just not a topological gamma, but it's some other gamma, which is universal as well. So, you know, if I drop the high order term, we could maybe still say that uh, okay and ignoring corner effects and all that stuff uh, maybe the the sat the the, the subadditivity is still kind of close to saturation yeah yeah that, that's the idea yeah that's the right idea. but with fermi surface then things are pretty off like because you have a log l to every single l and then the, you know the, the additivity uh, that that well l log l doesn't add so well so um, maybe oh sorry you mean the, the the bulk is now a cft yeah the well the Dirac cone is a cft right? okay okay, okay. yeah way. yeah so, yeah that's that's very likely yeah yeah but uh, i'm just saying that the fermi surface turns it into l log l and i just simply cannot add it by length and that that makes things pretty complicated Mm, right, yeah, thanks for the comment, yeah. Yeah, I have one related question. So you said the general goal is to um, use the entanglement dynamics to probe the topological invariance. Um, do you have like intuitions um, like for beyond hot connectivity and the hot central charge? For instance, the um, hot viscosity for the fresh corner hot systems, uh, which is basically shift. Uh, as they two, they two topological number for topological consider, um, can they be probed by entanglement uh, dynamics? Yeah, for Z two, for Z two, you mean like just topological insulator? Yeah, for example, yeah, that, that, that I have uh, a little bit more confidence based on some result we have for free fermion systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, whole viscosity, that's an interesting question, but I don't know. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, if there's no further questions, um, let's stop here and uh, thank you, Lihua, again. Yeah. Thanks, uh, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see you next week. Uh, see you.